Hi, so today's video is about a document called Subjective Refraction and Prescribing Glasses, uh, the number one parenthesis or number two close parenthesis guide to practical techniques and principles. Uh, it's written by a Richard J. Kolker MD. Um, I really, really liked it. It, it explained, um, it, it's basically a guide to conducting the eye test. It's very clear and simple. Um, it's very patient centred. I really like that. Um, and it's uh, about encouraging communication with the patient. Um, I mean, this is so simple that um, is, you know, opticians, obviously training opticians can understand it and eye, eye care professionals. Uh, but also um, anybody c can understand it, which is really, really good. Um, so I'm going to, you know, briefly go through it, hopefully briefly, um, you know, picking out um, some of the highlights here. Um, so we shall start with uh, the goal of refraction. Okay, so there are six principles, um, and number one, uh, refraction is the art of improving vision without medicine or surgery. Number two, um, refraction and prescribing glasses are best approached as problem solving. Um, so... I, I like this already. Um, number three, the process is more than measurement. That is really, really important. And what we measure is not necessarily what we give. So, um, you know, may, maybe someone is minus three, but they find minus three glasses too strong, so the optician gives them uh, a minus two and I'm kind of referring to all eye care professionals as optician. I know they're not but it's uh, an umbrella term um, and it's just easy to use the, the same word basically. Uh, history examination diagnosis and treatment decisions are necessary. Um, so you know, just as medical problems, history plays a large role in determining what will best help the patient. I like the words help the patient. So it's not just saying this is your measurement, plonking a pair of glasses on them and off you go. Um, so this is about finding out, um, you know, patient's history, what their needs are, um, and actually talking to them. And the goal is to give the simplest system that satisfies the individual, that individual patient's visual needs. Um, so, um, you know, I think he's American and probably, um, you know, America is a place where they try and sell you glasses with knobs and bells and whistles on if they can, much like the UK and most of Western Europe. Um, whereas someone might just want, uh, you know, a very plain pair of glasses, um, you know, just for everyday wear, um, so something cheap and effective. And the appropriate prescription is decided upon for and with each patient. So it means, you know, you do the measurements and then you talk to the patient, uh, you explain the measurements, you you've got, but the patient might say, well, I prefer something a little more, um, that might work better for me. Um, you know, maybe I need a bit of extra prism or, or whatever. Uh, so you talk it through and see what, what the patient needs. Explain and always show the patient binocularly what you will be prescribing for them. Uh, so that means talking the patient through the process, which um, 
only two opticians have ever done for me. The rest it's kind of like, okay, go and sit at that machine, what, what have you. Here's your prescription, off you go. And at that point, there's no further discussion. So I really, really like this approach. Um, so he goes on to talk about um, what 2020 means. Um, and then what the refractive errors are. Um, so that would be myopia and hyperopia to start with. Um, then he comes on to a fallacy alert. He's got a few of these and I think it's great that he puts uh, these in here. And this is something I've mentioned in some of my videos as well. Um, there is an interesting fallacy in the seemingly uh, straightforward term farsighted when not wearing corrective glasses a moderately nearsighted person has blurred vision at distance but can see clearly at near thus they can be called nearsighted so what he's saying is that description actually does what it says on the tin the term nearsightedness works uh, so, for a far-sighted person, um, that, you know, you think, um, you'd automatically think that, okay, they can't see close up, but they can see really, really far. Um, and that is absolutely not so. Um, so he says, a moderately far-sighted person has blurred vision at distance. Yes, they do. Um, I, can, I can tell you that. Uh, thus, the term far-sighted is a fallacy because the individual cannot see clearly at far without correction. Um, and it's really, really good that um, he, he says it. Um, and a far-sighted person has difficulty seeing at all distances, especially if they're far-sighted enough. Um, so, um, next he explains about astigmatism, and he uh, explains the shape of the lens. Um, so that makes sense of the sphere, no, the sphere is, uh, but there's the axis and, and the cylinder. So all those are the axis. And what I really, really like about all this is there's plenty of white space. Um, the diagrams are very, very clear, very simple. There's, there's no clutter. So it's really, really easy to understand. And I would definitely recommend, um, you know, if you're interested, actually looking up this article and uh, going through it. Um, more about astigmatism and how the cylinder works. Um, so... I mean, for, for me, um, it helped me understand astigmatism and how they do, how they exactly do the measurements, um, which I couldn't quite get before. Um, but like I say, this explains everything so simply and so clearly. Um, it's really, really good. Um, presbyopia. There's a fallacy alert at, on presbyopia, um, but I'll skip over that bit because it, I mean, it is quite long, 
Um, now, I like this bit about when you're testing a patient to find which ad to prescribe. So he's still on the presbyopia, although you would use um, uh, scrap that. Um, okay, it's important to ensure that the length strength they prefer is making the letter or numbers on the near card clearer rather than larger. Um, because, and it explains why, um, they may say they prefer the larger figures but the goal is to replace the the accommodation um, ability that's been lost over time um, and before they were presbyopic um, you know obviously they could see they could focus on the material but they didn't magnify it so you want to aim for the same as what they had before presbyopia um, and he says magnification is an indication that the ad is overly strong and will produce a reading range that is closer and narrower than necessary um, and then there's a fallacy alert and I've mentioned this in a few of my videos as well um, is common for over-the-counter reader glasses uh, to be referred to as magnifiers or plus glasses generally um, and they should really be call, called focuses um, and I, I can tell you now um, just because you've got a plus on your glasses they don't actually magnify when once you're focusing properly things are the proper size that uh, they should be and I had uh, well the last optician I went to it was actually the specialist like one of the three eye specialists uh, or one of the three top ones in the town um, you know giving me a bit of a lecture at uh, those glasses you're wearing they're magnifiers uh, and it was like end of discussion and I had no chance to say, well, no, they don't actually magnify. Um, and that was a specialist saying that. But this guy, um, he says, you know, he put, he puts it uh, straight here. So, uh, da, 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 da. so I'm going to hop over a bit more. We're on to bifocals, uh, reading glasses trifocals, progressions, computer glasses, um, okay, so progressive lenses, uh, is it progressive, what are PELs, progressive addition lenses, um, Oh, this is interesting. Many individuals were taught in school to move their eyes across the line of print when reading. So basically tracking. With the PAL, a progressive additional lens, one must move one's head so that one continues to look through the central part of the lens. Oh, so there's a middle bit. But he says, look, people can... Um, people are very often easily able to um, you know make this change um, so that's that's just a nice observation that you wouldn't normally get uh, well I, I don't judging by my own experience I don't think you'd normally get it at the optician uh, so on to computer lenses uh, and then there's some more plus minus conversion cylinder. Um, 
So then we get into the general, um, <coughs> the general eye test. So subjective refraction and lens prescription and the ferropter, that's when you sit in front of the Snellen chart, uh, they put those you know, funny glasses on you and put lenses in them um, and all of that. So um, he's talking about the, the best way of doing it so that, you know, basically you get the best result for yourself, you get the best result for the patient and you know, you get the most benefit out of it. And the way he's explaining it, it seems like, um, you know, the standard test. If, if, done, if done properly, it can actually be a really, really good tool. Um, so first it's, you know, making sure that you actually... Uh, the patient's actually sitting in a comfortable position and that you put the ferropter on properly in the right place. Uh, so make sure the patient's sitting still and you move it over to them. Um, okay. Next, next, next. Um... So, um, he says, have the patient work with the smallest line they can read. Now, I think in every single eye test, um, he explains why, that this, this allows for better fine-tuning uh, when you go on to the other tests, you know, when you're saying clearer, stronger, and and flipping the thing. So <clears throat> if you go down to the lowest line that they can read, um, you know, it, it allows you to, to fine tune what the measurements are a lot better. Um, and I have to say, when I've been at an eye test, um, I've just naturally gone down to the lowest line and started with that. And, you know, the, the optician said, oh, start from the letter at the top. <laughs> no, too late. I'm down here. Um, so, that's me. Uh, we go on to the sphere. Um, cylinder axis. Um, so, yeah, when they... How to turn the lenses. I just like that diagram um, I found it informative very clear uh, na, 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 cylinder power okay the adjustment right there's quite a lot of um, cylinder adjustment um, Oh, and I like, I like this. Uh, for step three, remember to return to a smaller line if a larger one had to be used during the axis location in step two. Um, oh, that, no, that might be referring to, no, that refers to something else. Forget that. Um... Oh yeah, and then he's got a very nice analogy, so he's kind of described it um, as similar to airplane baggage. Uh, okay, this is quite a long bit about the cylinder. Um, then he talks about fogging. Um, instructing patients. Uh, that's okay. So, how to talk uh, to the patients? Um,
to get the best out of the test. Um, so he goes on to um, over minusing here. Um, so for the um, for anyone um, who's been involved with the end myopia process. Um, you'll be familiar. You'll be familiar with the concept of over minusing. You know, you've been given a minus, adapted to that. Been given a stronger minus, adapted to that, and so on. Um, now, here, what he says is, if at the conclusion of a refraction, the measurement contains more minus spherical correction than the true refractive error the patient has been over minus and that might be what has happened with some people who've ended up um, you know of obviously getting into the end myopia movement um, to try and re return their, their eyes to uh, 2020. Over minusing results from the patient accommodating during the refraction um, so this is the first time, you know, I've actually heard this, uh, despite, you know, saying, you know, now saying uh, to opticians, look, I, I tend to over accommodate, you know, um, <laughs> but now this, this guy is actually talking about it. When the patient is accommodating more internal plus power, is added to the eye, thus requiring additional minus correction externally to offset it. So you're you're focusing more at, at close. So you are using your plus power, if you think about it. So the extra minus correction, and uh, all you opticians out there, hear this. All you eye professional specialists, whatever. Thus, the extra minus correction is not correcting the basic refractive error, it is only offsetting the accommodation. Um, so, yeah, and all you um, end myopia people out there, you know, that is good for you to know. You tell your opticians that. Um, if a patient were to be prescribed the over minus measurement in a pair of glasses when looking in the distance they would continually they would need to continually accommodate for the focal point to remain on the retina well i can tell you now um <clears throat> this happens all the time they are prescribed um over minus glasses that happens all the time it is um you know so, something like 50 percent here i think uh, here in norway uh, never mind something like 80% in some countries, uh, some Asian countries. Um, the, inter the internally added plus power would be needed to offset the extra minus power in the prescribed lens. So he explains, you know, perfectly clearly, don't over minus patients. This chronic accommodative tone, you know, thank you. <laughs> Uh, would be, and chronic is the word for it, because I've been there, would be likely to cause eye fatigue. Yes, it does. I can tell you that. In addition, it would leave less accommodation available for focusing at near, often resulting in a complaint of eye strain when reading. Um, yeah, I mean, a few opticians that I've been to really seriously need to be told that. Um, so there are four ways to avoid over minusing during subjective refraction, instructing the patient properly, cycloplegia, fogging techniques and the duochrome test. Um, so <clears throat> only one, only two, as I say, opticians have actually done it properly uh, for me. Um, so
so um now a cycloplegic refraction eliminates the concern about over minusing as the patient is unable to accommodate now that that is the only thing i would take issue with uh because it it it's not always a hard and fast rule um that it works all the time for all patients it usually does but not not always if the over accommodation is very pronounced or long standing for example uh just to be aware of that and with fogging techniques um you start them from a position of extra plus spherical power. So you avoid um, putting extra minus on them. And then you remove the plus power a little bit. And you stop as soon as um, they can see, you know, stuff on the, um, on the Snellen chart. Um... The duochrome test, oh, that's the the red and green um, okay, this, this is interesting. Um, so the red and green should appear equal if the red side appears clearer more minus power is needed. If the green side appears clearer, the eye is over minus. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, oh, I like that. Um, to make proper comparisons from visit to visit, the amount of effort the patient makes when reading the letters on the acuity chart must be kept consistent. It's not unusual for a patient to state that a line is too difficult to read, but then be able to read it when encouraged. <coughs> so I kind of, I, I do like that. Um, so it's encouraging them to try their best, um, you know, to make sure that they can actually read the line before you decide, oh, they can't read it, and then giving them the wrong prescription. Um, okay, I'm going to hop over the next bit. Um, Right, and then there's 16 tips. I'll hop over that. Um, mm, mm, mm. And, you know, he talks about when refracting a child because children's eyes are different. Um, there's all sorts of different situations, different patients. Um, uh, oh, if the patient is currently wearing glasses, ask them to compare what he has just measured to their glasses. Um, so, to, to make sure that the new prescription is better for them. Um, Right. 
Um, yeah, I like I like this as well. Uh, in several situations, it's important to put the contemplated prescription in a trial frame and have the patient take a short walk before writing the prescription. Uh, no one has ever, ever uh, given that to me and I think that is an excellent suggestion. Um, the plan change may well be so blah, may be well tolerated sitting in the exam chair but walking with the prescription is more likely to identify a problem and yet yeah, because sitting in the exam chair reading um, the letters that is not the same as real life functioning so this is a this is an excellent suggestion um, so you can actually um, the trial run can be presented to a patient as a test drive and should be done when there's a large change um, in the prescription um, it's the patient's first pair of glasses because that can feel very different for people um, and yeah there is also um, something I hopped over but was actually there um, the first time I read through is when you're doing the test with, with the phoropter um, to make sure that the patient isn't, you know, squinting to, to look at anything on the Snellen chart. Um, I squint all the time and, um, you know, no one's really checked to make sure that I'm just looking at it in a relaxed uh, manner. So um, that that is another good thing to look out for. Um, so, what else, what else, what else? Mm. Okay, I'm halfway through. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's often helpful to begin by discussing two conflicting myths um, with the first pair of glasses. Uh, you should wear your glasses all the time, for if you don't, you're straining your eyes. Um, so I'm, I'm glad he's um, saying that's a bit of a fallacy. Um, and the other one is don't start wearing glasses because your eyes will become weak and dependent on them. And he is right, neither is correct. I mean, n number two... Um, if you become dependent, you know, especially if you're over minus, that's because you've been prescribed the wrong glasses. <coughs> I'm dependent on mine, but that's because I actually need them. I function better with them. Um, so, yeah. Um... Uh, special situations. Mm. Okay, there's... I'm about halfway through... Um, and I think... This actually does, um, okay, this is going, this is reiterating stuff, a lot of it that has already been said. Uh, this is about myopia. So, There's something hyperopia, a case study, 37 year old, single vision, um, having difficulty reading, is this presbyopia? Uh, 
I like this the patient most likely has hyperopia that is not being fully corrected um, because hyperopia it um, it progresses you always have the same amount of hyperopia it's just that more more and more of it comes out um, Okay, so, right, there's, there's a few interesting things for hyperopia. Um, but there, there is a lot more to this. This is all case studies now, so I like... I really like that he's included all these pace, case studies because it's about thinking about individual patients and their, their situations um, here. I'm just going to briefly, briefly, and again it's reiterating things about lenses um, and situations you'd use them in. Um, right, so I'm going to wrap it up here. This is all uh, case studies as far as I can see. Yeah, lots and lots of case studies. Um, you know, I like that because there's there's a lot for the trainee um, to to think over and work with with their um, so yeah very very definitely uh, a really good read and so that was I'll have to scroll right back up subjective refract Subjective Refraction and Prescribing Glasses by mm -mm. It scrolls up fast by Richard J. Kolker, MD.